I want to share with you something today that I've been teaching and developing for 30 years. I've taught it before, wrote a book about it, uh, taught it many times. What's different about today is the seriousness of how it may apply to us. Understand, I'm, I'm not a prophet. I uh, don't have individual special revelation from God. God has not spoken to me, but I am a Bible teacher. And I'm breaking things down, teaching verse by verse, taught through just about every book of the Bible, verse by verse. It's all online. Uh, but if, if you do that, you do begin to understand things. You do begin to see things. Uh, the character of God is revealed, what he expects from people, how he responds to people, positively, negatively. It, it doesn't leave much room for the imagination. It doesn't leave much room for the modern Western church to find you know, Jesus in their heart. Uh, you find Jesus in the revelation of the text of Scripture. He can change your heart. The Spirit can live in your life, but uh, you don't create God. That's called idol worship. Uh, and, and again, that's another whole topic. And it kind of leads us to where we're at. So, again, I'm sorry about what I'm about to say, uh, what I'm teaching to you. I, again, it's not new. I've taught it for 30 years, developed it for 30 years. Um, uh, but it's time to explain it again and update it. Um, so here we go. Uh, I have got this in a book, Hope for Mary's Last Generation, written in 2007. I had a little, had a little booklet I put together in 2002, taught this in the late 80s, taught it in the 90s, taught it in several churches. Uh, so, I mean, this is not the first time. So what I'm telling you is nothing like, ooh, I've got insight. Uh, no, I'm going to just repeat what I've been saying, uh, what I've been teaching, what the Bible ties together. You may be the one who sees things and understands things differently, but probably not. Probably not, because part of this whole system, this message, is that when we get to this point, it's, it's hearts are set. Well, consider Pharaoh. Moses came in, spoke to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart ten times, eleven times, or however you you know, whatever point that God began to harden his heart. But he had you know eleven or ten, ten plagues and a couple signs. Um, Jesus came to a gener I mean, the Son of God came to Jerusalem, and he couldn't change their hearts. Jeremiah, Isaiah came to Judah didn't change their hearts. Uh, and what I'm sharing with you today is just what the Word of God says. Uh, if, it, if it changes your heart, that's, that's the miracle. That's the power of God right there. But the Word of God is like the sun. It, it, the sun will harden the clay, but it will melt the wax, if you understand that. Meaning, God is going to shine his word to you. And if your heart is wax, it will melt before him. If your heart is clay, it will harden before him. It's just the word of God that goes out like a seed. And the heart, if it's the road, if it's the gravel along the side of the road, if it's the weeds in the ditch, or if it's the good soil, the seed the word, the truth, the proclamation, the message, the invitation, it's the same. What changes the result is your heart. So if your heart is hard, I'm sorry. This is just going to piss you off. If your heart is open to God and you're searching, maybe because you're a believer, maybe because of situations you're like wondering, What's, what the heck's going on? You, you, your heart may respond. Again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm sorry. I, after this video, I'm going to continue teaching, but I'm going to go to basic Bible teaching. This is Bible teaching, but it's so pertinent, it's scary. I may be wrong. I'm a Bible teacher. The Bible's not wrong. The Bible teacher might be wrong. 
So you do have that going for you. You can disagree with me, find your own verses, and uh, correct it. <laughs> Please, if you can correct it, we all want it corrected. But this is where I'm at. This is what I know. This is what I've been teaching. Here we go. In Exodus 20, we're going to begin with a verse there, right out of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. I'm going to read it to you right here. And we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the character of God and how God responds to people. Actually responds to uh, cultures, responds to generations as they build on each other. Remember, uh, previously... I went over chapter 30 of Proverbs, verse 11 through 14, and described for you four characteristics of four sequential generations, four turnings, four in the Hebrew doors, that, that change, the, the turnings, the cycles, the generations. The first is those who curse their father and mother. In other words, they don't want what they've been handed down. And it doesn't mean they swear at them. It means they consider them trivial. They, they, they consider it not important. And they move away from what their parents offered them. And we're assuming it was godly information, godly truth. They produce a generation that then, it says, is pure in their own eyes, but is not cleansed of their filth. They think they've solved the problem, but they haven't. They think they took a shower, but they took a shower in the sewer. So it's like, yes, you wash yourself, but you washed yourself with sewage. Uh, that's the second generation, but they don't know it, and you can't tell them anything different. They've, they've, they've walked away from the truth. They're in darkness, thinking they're walking in light. The, the third generation is arrogant. They're, they're proud. Their eyelids are, are lifted. Their eyes are up, uh, up ha they're haughty. Uh, they're the proud generation, the me generation. They're the generation who thinks they not, they've got all the answers. They know what's going to be done, and they're going to do it their way. They are very selfish, very self-centered. They produce the fourth generation. This is right out of Proverbs, and it's repeated throughout Scripture. You can see the patterns. Uh, the fourth generation is their teeth are set with knives, their, their jaws like swords. To devour the poor and needy from the earth, the poor from among mankind. So this is now the Hamas generation, a Hebrew word for violence, which refers to social violence of those that have begin to crush. They have no respect for people. It's only themselves. They have, they're intolerant. They're intolerant of anything else, and they're going to drive their agenda. In fact, they're going to crush the third generation. The third generation who are haughty and proud, the very generation they produce, that generation is going to turn on them and take everything from them, crush them, and do what they want. That is the end of the cycles. That is the end of the four-generation cycle. There's no fifth generation. Because when social violence, Hamas, gets that serious in a culture, if it's Israel, if it's a Gentile nation, if you think you're a Christian nation, God will move in. Ah, I'm not telling God what, I don't know what God is doing. I just know what the word of God says. It, it's written. It is when a generation, a society gets to that level, God moves in and makes corrections. Uh, no, no, he doesn't, there's no repentance. He, he eliminates that culture, that nation from history. Okay, here we go. Exodus chapter 4, the, 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 the command, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in, in heaven above or that is on earth beneath and that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, that, that's an interesting, a jealous God. Oh, I thought he was a God of love. No, he's a jealous God, meaning I want it my way or no way. He's, he's jealous. That's not necessarily a positive human characteristic. God is a jealous God. There's no room for anything else. There's no room for any other opinion. I'm jealous. This is what I want, and I want you to do it this way. Yeah, when did you hear that preached in church last? He, I mean, he describes himself, I am a jealous God. He doesn't try to, I am a God of love and patience and tolerance. No, I'm a jealous God. So I'm telling you what to do and understand I'm jealous. Meaning, well, let's really read on. I am a jealous God. Interesting line right here. Visiting, good translation, I'll explain it. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the 
third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. You want the love of God? You love God. You go to God, he responds with love. But you walk away from him, understand, he's a jealous God. He's going to come get you, or he's going to come destroy you. I'm not making this up. Read the text, read the Bible. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I know, it, it's hard to swallow because it, you, you probably go to church, and, and you listen to happy messages, positive messages. Everything's going to be okay. Not, not, no, it's not out for everybody. Because these people that walk away from God, who hate God, uh, he's watching over their sin, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. Now what this means, I'm going to go to Ezekiel now and, and show you an example here of, of what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. Uh, because again, that's the, that was God revealed to the Jews. Understand that he's talking to Israel. He's talking to his covenant nation. And so there's going to be uh, a difference between a Gentile nation and, or our nation and the nation of Israel in this context. But the character of God remains the same. And the way God deals with nations or temporal institutions of government, cultures, nations, empires, remains the same. Israel falls under that category of a, a natural government, a, a nation. Now, they had a covenant with God, but they are also temporal. They could be removed from history like other nations, but when other nations are removed from history, they never come back. They, that when a nation is judged and removed from history, they don't come back. Israel has a covenant, and so they're always going to have to come back to fulfill their role in God's plan. That's unique about Israel. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. That explains that. That's, that's deep waters. But nonetheless, Israel is a special nation, but nonetheless, they're being treated like all the other nations. This same pattern is going to follow the Amorites or the Canaanites. It's going to follow the Assyrians. It's going to follow throughout history. So again, don't, don't use these. Well, that's Israel. Right, this is Israel, but this is still the God that is dealing with all of cultures. Nonetheless, this is taking way too long for me to get through this, and I apologize. Now, they were saying, they began to interpret that, if the fathers sin, then God will punish that, those fathers or those, that people up until the third or fourth generation. In other words, if your third or fourth generation is suffering, it's probably because of what your fathers did uh, 150 years ago. Uh, so, for example, uh, it, whatever happened in, in the 1870s, the 1880s, in the 1900s, we're being punished for it today. That's the carnal understanding of this. That's the wrong understanding of this. And that's the way Israel understood it. And for example, I'm in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 2 now, several hundred years later. Now they're in captivity, and they're saying, hey, we're in captivity because our fathers sinned, and we just get the punishment. And so here it is. Uh, they say, uh, the word of the Lord came to me. So Ezekiel, a prophet, says the word of the Lord came to him, and, he, and he, God is saying, the Lord is saying to Ezekiel, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? And this is what the people were saying now. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the fathers eat sour grapes, and they get that tingling feeling in their mouth. No, not the fathers. The children do. So the fathers eat the fruit. The children get the results. That is what the, the, the contemporary preachers were saying in Ezekiel's day in Babylonian captivity. It's like, you have done nothing wrong. It's your fathers that sinned, and so we're just getting the, the judgment for your father. So don't worry about changing your ways. Don't worry about yourself. Your fathers have eaten sour grapes, and you're just reaping the results of that. God tells Ezekiel, these people are saying this. That's stupid doctrine. So now Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 14 uh, he's going to correct it. So in other words, if you tie that verse into what we just read in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, that he'll observe, he'll visit the iniquity or the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, that does not mean, and God is explaining here in chapter 18, that does not mean the fathers sinned in the first generation, and now I'm going to wait until, you know, the third or fourth generation, and then I'm going to really unleash my wrath. It's like, no, 
No, that's not it. You go back to Proverbs. The first generation, Proverbs 30, produces the second generation who has a worldview that's going to result in the third generation and their behavior and their actions and their attitude, which is going to produce the fourth generation because they're raised by the third generation follow the philosophy of the second generation who left the truth in the first generation. So each generation is declining. It's, it's getting further from the truth. It's like the sin of Jeroboam. Throughout the Old Testament, in, in talking about the kings of Israel in the north, they could never repent of the sin of Jeroboam. They didn't, even, they didn't even understand they were in darkness. They were pure in their own eyes, but yet not cleansed of their filth. And so they, when they came around to trying to repent, getting right with God, they had no idea what it looked like. Thus the importance of the Word of God. If you're trying to get right with God, checking your heart and, and following what you feel, you're never going to find your way. This tells you how to get right with God. It's a huge problem. You don't make up God. You discover who God, what God has revealed to you. You accommodate God by doing it his way. Thus, he gave you the word. Nonetheless, the people think they're being punished in, Nebuch uh, in uh, uh, Ezekiel's day because of their father's sin. But here it is, chapter 18 of Ezekiel, verse 14. Uh, it says, Now suppose this man's fa this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Does not defile his neighbor's wife. Does not oppress. Goes and gives you a whole list of things. He says, as for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what is not good among the people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. But he goes on and says, but the son who repents and says, I'm not going to, I'm going to break this cycle. He says he will live. He will not die for the sin of his fathers. He can repent and come back and separate himself from that. This is what it is saying. Now the word, going back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, the word that is in there, that he will observe, that he will visit. It's the word paka in the Hebrew. It means to visit. It means to oversee. It means to examine and inspect. It means to look after. What God is saying very clearly is when the father's sin or the first generation sins walks away from the truth, he is going to observe that iniquity into the second, the third, and fourth generation. Not the fifth. There's not going to be a fifth. There's either repentance or there's removal. He's going to oversee that. He's going to examine that sin. How does that sin take seed? Does it begin to grow? Does their rejection of the truth lead to a false philosophy in the second generation, which leads to false, incorrect behavior and attitude and a worldview in the third behavior, which leads to social injustice and social Hamas violence in the fourth generation, where they're just devouring people for their own needs, their own desires, and God's going to now have to intervene. If it gets that far, he will intervene. He's going to oversee, examine, to visit the iniquity of the fathers. He's going to watch it develop or watch it not grow into the third and fourth generation. Now, it says right there, for those that love God, he shows them love for a thousand generations. In other words, if you pull out of that cycle and join God's plan, his love is poured out, his blessings is poured out, and he takes care of you. For a th You just keep walking in the light, and his light is eternal. But you begin a cycle of rebellion against God in the first generation, you're going to produce the second generation. And that second generation is not going to know what's right and what's wrong. They're going to create their own philosophy. It's going to create and produce the third generation who are going to take actions, but they're going to implement that philosophy, which is going to raise a generation in complete darkness, so confused, so dark, they're going to devour people for their own benefit. And God is going to intervene. He will not. And it goes throughout, throughout history. God will take that nation down. Okay. We go to another verse. Genesis chapter 15. We see an example of this. Just, just an example. Genesis chapter 15. Okay. Um, I could read this. I, I, I could read it. I'll just tell you what. I've got it. I could find it here. But I, it, it talks about God talking to Abraham, telling Abraham he's going to go uh, to a, a foreign land. And God's making an Ab the Abrahamic covenant with him. He says you'll be you know, strangers in a foreign land. He says, for four generations, for 400 years. He says, I'm giving you this land, the land of Israel. I'm giving you the land of Canaan. He says, the land, the Canaanites, the Amorites live there. He says, this is your land. But it's not time for you to have the land yet. I'm going to give it to you after you've been in a foreign land as slaves 
for four generations, for 400 years, because the sin of the Amorites, he says, is not yet full. In other words, they are beginning that cycle of one, two, three, four generations. In that day, it was numbered as one, two, three, four hundred years, a hundred years per generation. He says, you're going to have to be taken down into Egypt. He doesn't give them this country, but they are taken to Egypt. They're there for four generations. They go down with Jacob's sons. Jacob's sons, for example, Joseph goes first, and then the sons follow, along with their father, in the 1700s B.C. Uh, Joseph and then his brother Levi, for example. Levi is going to have a son named Kohath, who's going to live in the 1600s B.C. Kohath is going to have a son named Amram, the third generation, who's going to live in the 1500s B.C. And Amram is going to have a son named Moses, who's going to live in the 1400s and into the 1300s B.C. Those are your one, two, three, four generations, Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses, and those are your years. Moses is going to come out and going to lead the people with Joshua into the land, and they'll take the land of Canaan. But it was going to be a four, the Amorites have to run through the cycle of the four generations. Notice there, the Amorites or the Canaanites, the people that were living in, the nations that were living in the land of Canaan at the time, were not Israelites. They did not have the covenant, but God still is treating them in that four generation cycle. Now, oh, okay, this is where it gets sad. Now, Leviticus 26. Um, God is not just going to uh, inspect, observe, and just sit with his arms crossed watching these generations decline. He's going to intervene. He's going to intervene at, in each generation, trying to shock the people, trying to draw the people back, trying to make them look in the mirror of their heart and say, have we made a mistake? H have we got a false philosophy? Are, are, is our worldview lined up with reality? Maybe we should seek the truth. Maybe we should make some adjustments. He's going to do that for the first generation. Say, hey, 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 a bad decision. And then they're going to make a decision. And they're going to go into the second generation. If they don't make a correction, they're going to produce the second generation. You understand how hard it is to pull out of this circle, this cycle, um, with an entire culture. Individually, yes, you can make, of course, adjustments. You recognize the truth of God's word. You repent. You get in line with God. And now you are in a relationship with God. But understand, you are still part of a society that may reject the truth that you've embraced. It, it happens. I mean, throughout the Bible. I mean, Abram was one of them. Uh, Noah was one of them. Uh, the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea. I mean, listen, listen to these guys talk. Ezekiel. I mean, they're looking at, the, why does anybody else see this? I mean, they're frustrated, even frustrated with God. It's like, what, what's going on? Why don't we make some, why don't we fix this? The, the people aren't responding. So again, you're, you're a member of two culture, two, two uh, kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, that the nation you are part of. And if your nation goes down, you're going down with it. But you are a member of the kingdom of God, and he will take you through that into his kingdom. Uh, you know, God doesn't deliver the Christians out of their nations. Now, there will be a time in history, eschatologically, we'll see God intervene in a mighty way. Uh, that's another story. What we're talking about is now how God responds to each of those four generations. And we're in Leviticus chapter 26. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not even going to read the fifth cycle of judgment. It's the overthrow of the nation. I'm not going to read it. I'll tell you where it's at. You can read it yourself. Uh, but it's too disturbing for me to put on a video and just send it out in the public. It's, it's like, it, it's bad. But anyway. Okay, so uh, chapter 26, verse 14, there's going to be one, two, three, four levels of God responding. The first response is to the first generation. The second to the second generation. The third response to the third generation. The fourth is to the fourth generation, warning them. But if they do not change in that fourth generation, there's the fifth cycle of discipline, which is basically wasting the land and the overthrow of their government and their nation. Um, so God is giving them a chance all the way through this to make a correction. He's observing, he's examining, he's inspecting the original sin into the third and fourth generation. Just like he said in Exodus, just like we see uh, in, in Genesis as an example, uh, we see, I can give you examples of northern Israel falling this way, uh, Judah falling, 
Jerusalem falling. The prophets came. The prophets spoke. I'm not a prophet. I'm just teaching you what the prophets said and what God did in a historical document called the text of Scripture. There we go. The first cycle. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commands, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all the commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I, the Lord, will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes and make the heart ache. And you shall sow your seed in vain. Those students talks all about these things. And he talks about what happens during that first generation. Then when the second generation comes, verse 18, and if in spite of this, and we're assuming there's some time, he's got he's to do this to that generation, and then watch how they respond. I mean, it's not going to be like a 10-minute test. It's going to be a period of, of several years. How are you responding to these events I'm sending your way? He says, uh, and if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. I will break the pride of your power, and I will make the heavens like iron and the earth like bronze. In other words, famine. And we can talk about economic upheaval. I'm going to show you this. That's the second generation. The third generation. Then if you walk contrary to me and do not listen to me, I will continue sevenfold over your sins and I will let those uh, I'll let loose with the wild beasts against you and again wild beasts in those days you know they the land would be ravaged and so the wild animals were looking for food you couldn't go on the roads uh, and eventually it manifests as crime the wild beasts against you which shall be review of your children there's gonna be crime uh, there's gonna be wild beasts and now your children are going to be taken and destroy your livestock and make you few in number so that your roads shall be deserted. It's not safe to travel like it used to be. That's, that's the third generation. Now here we go, the fourth generation. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you. And I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins. And I will bring a sword up on you. This, this fourth generation, it is greeted when it begins this fourth cycle of this generation. The fourth cycle of discipline begins with the sword striking the land. I'll bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your city, so this is going to happen and now you're going to have a time to adjust to the sword striking the land. Now, if you don't adjust at the beginning of the fourth generation, then you're going to end up in cities where I will send pestilence or plagues among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I break your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in a single oven and shall dole out your bread again by weight, and you shall eat but not be satisfied. Now, what it's saying right there. I'm going to strike the land to let you know, wake up. If there's no response, I'm going to send a plague that's going to cripple you, and you're going to become weak, militarily weak because of this plague, and your enemies are going to start taking advantage of you, and it's going to lead to rationing food. That's when it's talking about ten women. Ten women would represent ten families baking bread for their families, but there's so little food, there's so little bread, that ten families can cook in one oven. It's being, food is being rationed out. And that's what's taking place. In the fourth generation, it's going to be struck with the sword. Think about it. No response. A plague is going to come. It's going to cripple you militarily, economically. Your enemies are going to come in and start controlling you. And you're going to end up having to ration out food until the end of that cycle, until the end of that fourth generation. And then chapter 8 to 26, Leviticus 26, verse 27. But if in spite of this, at the end of the fourth generation, but if in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me during that fourth generation, there's no turning around, and it's really hard to turn around. It's really hard to change a culture. I, I'm not, I'm giving, I'm explaining this to you. I'm not offering you hope. I mean, God will give you hope. 
The Spirit of God can give you hope. I'm telling you what the Word of God says, uh, and the Word of God describes human hearts, human nature. There's hope in God. There's hope in the truth. There's hope in Christ. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of hope. But we're dealing with the human heart, the human condition. That unless God moves in your heart, unless you respond to God, there's no hope outside of God. If you reject God, if you're laughing at this, saying, well, this doesn't make I've got like, I know, right? It sounds stupid. It sounds ancient. It sounds barbaric. It sounds like, like superstition. Go your way. But you might want to read, it, just in case you're wondering, you might want to read verses, chapter 26, verse 28. In, it says, in theory, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. Verse 29. Read Leviticus 26, verse 29. I'm not going to read it. It, it, it makes me want to cry. It, it, it makes me, I want to just break down and just sob. It's like, it's like, well, that's ridiculous. They're just exaggerating. Oh my God, why, why, be, why, why, why be so ignorant? It's like what is in verse 29 takes place in Israel. It takes place in the fall of Jerusalem in 586. It's recorded by Josephus as he observed it in 70 A.D. as Jerusalem fell. It's recorded throughout history, time and time again, when a civilization, a culture, a nation is, is out of options. So it will never happen here. We've got cell phones. We've got technology. Right, you've got trucks, too. Semis trying to get food to your grocery stores. I mean, you understand, it's probably going to be easier to make this happen in our day than it was in 586 B.C. or 70 A.D. or to the Amorites in 1405 B.C. Anyway, those are the five cycles of judgment. Plague in the first generation, famine, economic upheaval in the second generation, crime and rapid uncontrolled society in the third generation, and then the sword strikes land followed by famine, followed by enemy invasion and, and conquering until you're, you're rationing out food. And then if there's no change, no re reaching out to God, then the land is wasted. Now, I, I, I think I want to share this right now. Uh, in, in Nineveh, a Gentile nation, the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, in, in the year 756, or 765, 765, uh, they had become the, the old Assyrian Empire had spread across the map and uh, they began to decline and in set, now this is in their own documents their own document I mean you can read the chronicles of uh, this was great about archaeology you can, you can go back and find their inscriptions uh, but nonetheless in 765 there was a plague that struck the land and Nineveh basically collapsed because their military was so weak in 764 BC they couldn't go out and march. They couldn't march out. Now, that, that was really, you can like it or not like it. It's just a fact that's the way the empires were. Their, one of their sources of economy was invasion. Uh, again, we don't encourage this behavior in America. Uh, I hope not. Um, but when they needed to kind of, every year, they'd go out to battle. In fact, it talks in the Bible about when kings go to war and the season when the kings go to war. They go out and try and conquer land, and whatever they conquered, that would be part of the economy for the year. The national uh, 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 economy would be improved with invading lands. So the kings would go out every year. That's part of the job of the king was go out and invade and expand the borders. That's why you want to have a military. Unless, you know, you're all going to sing Imagine with John Lennon and Yoko. Uh, and then imagine that imagine that actually working. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, 765, a plague strikes Nineveh. It's in the documents. 764, the military was so weak, so devastated, they couldn't march. They couldn't go out to war, which means the economy was devastated. People are dead. Business are slow. There's no advancement of the economy. The military can't march. Now, in 763, again, it won't mean much to you, but it did to them, on June 15th, there was a solar eclipse in 763. Now, to you, it's like, well, 
you know, Isaac Newton and Galileo, they explained all these things, and, and that's, not, that's great. Science is true. But for these people, 764, 763 on June 15th, uh, an eclipse, it, it stunned them. I mean, it, it, it got dark during the middle of the day, and they're just recovering from a plague. Their military is too weak to go anywhere. The economy's devastated, and now it's dark in the middle of the day. They're freaking out. Then revolts began to break out. Society is collapsing in Nineveh, in, the, in the Assyria, in 763. So for the next three years, there's going to be constant revolts of powers. The king's got no credibility, and so he's always you know, trying to justify himself. He's being challenged. There's wars within the city. Assyria empires basically collapsed down to within a 100-mile radius around Nineveh at this time. It's over. The plague, the military's weak, the econ economy's gone. There's an earthquake, or not earthquake, there's a solar eclipse. Uh, there's revolts. And then in seven, or 760, right during around this time period, we can't give a date like we can the solar eclipse, but that right in 760, right within that time period, there was a, a major earthquake that started somewhere in Syria and, and radiated out from there, going through Nineveh, shaking them. And then in 760, recorded in their records, 760, a second plague hit. I mean, they're, they're carting off dead bodies. They're not wearing masks. They're trying to offer to their gods, trying to figure out what to do. They're trying burning stuff to their gods, praying, trying to figure out what to do. And uh, the second plague now has them just, I mean, there's nothing left. I mean, they're so weak. They're, they're desperate. This is where they don't record it, but this is where if you want to take the Bible and slide the Bible into these historical events, the book of Jonah fits perfect. Because right after this, there is a stabilization. Tiglath-Pileser comes in, reorganizes everything, re restructures the entire government, and builds the Assyrian Empire up into the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the new Assyrian Empire that's going to devastate Israel, and, and Sennacherib's going to come down and attack all of Judah and eventually Jerusalem. Thus, Jonah was not interested in going there and giving them the message God wanted. He did not want to spare these people. He wanted them to suffer for their sins. And God says, go tell them, I'm going to destroy the city in 40 days. And when they heard this, Nineveh, it says, repented. And through the best of their knowledge, from their understanding of God in human nature, in human society, uh, the revelation that they could understand as a pagan, they didn't become Jewish, they repented for their Hamas. And we can see this in Micah and Amos. What does God expect from you, old man? To be just, to act righteously, to walk humbly before your God. This is some basic things. You don't need to know the Bible to know this. You need to be just. You need to walk humbly before your God. And this is enough to get you back on track. If you'll do that much today, if you'll humble yourself before God, where you'll walk humbly before God, that you'll do just, you'll, you'll walk away from Hamas, social violence, and embrace the concept of God, not some humanism. We're going to talk about humanism, but embrace God's righteousness, his standard. That's what Nineveh did. And they became one of the most powerful empires in the history after this. So yeah, there's, there's an example of someone repenting uh, and coming back. Then they left. Now, we've talked about the four generations, characteristics of the four generations from Proverbs. We've talked about God in, in, in Exodus saying, I will oversee, I'll watch, I'll examine the sin of the fathers and how it develops into the third and fourth generation. And then we've seen the five cycles of discipline that he's going to bring to each generation, trying to draw them back. But if they continue in their rebellion, he's going to strike them with something else. Now we come to our situation today. I, I, I'm taking a lot of time here. I, I've got a book. Hope for Mary's Last Generation. I can't send it to you. I don't have any more copies. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, just look for it. Hope for Mary's Last Generation. Type my name in. If you spell it wrong, you'll still find it in Google search probably. Um, I've also got it online. I'll put a link up. You can look through it. So all these things are detailed in, in greater detail here. You don't have to agree with it. Sometimes I wonder if I agree with it. I know I don't want to believe in it, but it's, it fits the situation. Uh, again, I'm not a fly-by-night prophet showing up just with some kind of tragic news. I, I've, been, I've got documentation of me teaching this since 1989. 
taught it in the 90s, taught it in churches, wrote papers, notes, wrote booklets, wrote a book. It's all over the internet. I mean, not everywhere, not far enough, but it's, it's out there. It's on my website. So I can get you the book. What I'm going to tell you now is uh, this is kind of like the climax of this whole thing. Is where are we at today? And I, again, I, I've got so much to, to, to put together to, and I, I don't want to bore you with it. So I, I may I may end up going too fast. But we have begun the four generation cycle as our own culture. The Bible doesn't say this. This is me looking at what I've just said. What I've told you, I think is absolutely true. It's the Word of God. And it can be rearranged and adjusted and taught differently than I've taught it. But the Word of God has integrity. So however you're going to put it together, that's what the Bible says. God is jealous. He's overseeing sin. He's watching things into the third and fourth generation. He promises he'll destroy cultures if they come into rebellion, but he's not going to do it like overnight. He's going to take a period of time to do it, give you a chance. He did to Israel or Jerusalem or Israel three times, and then they're coming back again. So that's true, but does it apply to us? Of course, right now, everybody's looking for, you know, jumping on the bandwagon. I'm not jumping on the bandwagon. I am the bandwagon, okay? I, I've, been, I've been driving this bandwagon for 30 years. Generation Word is about this bandwagon. It began in our culture in the 1880s when our seminaries and higher critical thinking in scriptures, in, in Bible colleges and universities, seminaries, began to question the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, Julius Wellhausen, I could read about him, he began to teach that Moses didn't write Moses. They taught in the 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, the writing wasn't even developed by the time Moses wrote. You may have heard this, it's still out there. Moses could have written, the Bible was made up, it was, it's a fable. The problem with that, scientifically, is they now know not only could Moses write, Abraham could write. Not only could Abraham write, Abraham's wife could write, which is not a slam against women, but meaning it was so thorough that not just the men, but in cultures, there were cultures that had writing that servants were writing. Scribes, there's a job, a profession. Being a scribe was a profession. So that, that, whole, that whole statement is false. But... It swept through the seminaries, and, and they lost confidence in the scriptures. They wanted to hold on to Christianity, but they didn't use the Bible. They took the concepts, love, kindness, work together, tolerance, help all people. All that is good, but remember, the foundation is God and God's standards, not humanistic. Now, that's where we're going. So between 1880 and 1920, we're going to call it Generation 40 Years. Because, for example, in Joshua, Moses came out of the wilderness. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. David talks about 40 years or a lifetime being 70 years or a generation being 40 years. You can argue with me on that if you want to. I know we, we go every, like, 15, 20 years because everybody's got their own little generation. Um, I'm of the boomer generation, of the baby boomers. So that's where you just say, oh, okay, boomer. Uh, I understand that. Because, yeah, yeah, I understand that. But anyway, in the 1800s, 1880s, and 1920s, guys that were coming out with new philosophies and rejecting Christianity, I could read it to you. I, I want to read to you what they said. I've got, I've got notes right, right here. I, I could read what they said. But basically, they reject Christianity. They reject the Word of God. Then following that was Karl Marx, uh, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud. And then I want to read to you in this book, uh, uh, Robert Ingersoll was traveling the nation a great speaker. We've got a street here in town named Ingersoll Avenue uh, in Des Moines. Uh, named after him. But he was the chief blaster going around and, and mocking the scriptures and mocking Moses and all these things. And, uh, and they had a generation that began to lose confidence in the Word of God. I know this. I mean, this is, this is uh, Charles Machen is going to come out and, and, and identify it in the next generation. The next generation is going to be 1921 to 1960. So if that first generation was those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers, that means that was the generation that says, no, we don't accept this. We're going to find something. We considered it trivial. The Word of God, trivial. 
we're going to keep the, the part about social justice. In fact, in 1908, the, the, the Council of Churches got together and wrote uh, a, a, a section on, on how they're going to help people and, and serve people. But what they're doing is they're writing, laying the foundation for uh, secular humanism. In 1921-1960, it's the Federal Council of Churches that did that. But the guy that's going to be pertinent is, uh, I'm going to read in page 145, 145. Secular humanism. Uh, the Humanist Manifesto is, again, now the new philosophy for the second generation who is going to be pure in their own eyes but are not cleansed of their filth. There's a response after you've destroyed Scripture, the authority of Scripture, we got a found new foundation. Ah, we've got an idea. Humanism, secular humanism. And in 1933, they write between in the second generation, they write the Humanist Manifesto. Uh, let me read this. Uh, I've got a, here's just a few of the articles. I've got it all written out in here. It, it listed 15 articles that they believe. Number one, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Are you secular? No, stay, this is important if you hold on right here. Religious humanists, they write. See, they're not saying we're, we're, we're not religion. We are a religion. We're a new philosophy. We're religious humanists. Regard the universe as self existing and not created. So they are religion, but they live in a world that was not created by God. It just exists. That's why they're going to eventually be called secular humanists. Their third point, holding an organic view of life, humanists find that the traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. You don't have a mind living in a body. Your mind is part of your body. It's just chemical reactions. You're really not there. You're just responding chemically. Eight, Religious humanist considers the complete realization of human personality to be the end of man's life and seeks its development and fulfillment in the here and now. This is the explanation of the humanist social passion. Now, see, this is what gets confusing. The church is to serve society and have compassion on people. The humanist secular socialist here, or human secular humanist social passion is also a driving factor. It's just they're doing it not to just alleviate people's suffering on earth while we wait for eternity. They're doing it because all you've got is this life. This is it. What happens here is all that happens. When you die, you're gone. So let's help people have their best life now. What? Sounds like a church. I know. Verse number nine, not in verse, but point nine. In place of the old attitudes involved in worship and prayer, the humanist finds his religious emotions expressed in a heightened sense of a personal life and in cooper cooperative effort to promote social well-being. Again, nothing wrong with that except they've just mocked God. They've taken God out of the equation. Says, We're going to do all this without God. Thus they're called humanists, secular humanists, doing what they think is right, but in their own eyes. They're setting the stage for the third generation. Because this is the philosophy coming from the first generation. The next generation is going to implement it. Man, number 11, man will learn to face the crisis of life in terms of his knowledge of their naturalness and probability. We assume that humanism will take the path of social and mental hygiene and discourage sentimental and unreal hopes and wishful thinking, meaning religion, spirituality, uh, God, Christianity. In fact, it's going to refer to uh, the dying corpse of Christianity in here somewhere. Um, so stand these theses of religious humanism. Though we consider the religious forms and ideas of our fathers no longer adequate, the quest for the good life is still the central task of mankind. 34 people signed this Humanist Manifesto. The ninth signature on that Humanist Manifesto, John Dewey. 
John Dewey, one of the paramount philosophers and educators in American history, laid the foundation for the public school system beginning in the 1920s. John Dewey. Again, you can be a great doctor, a great philosopher, a great scientist, a great farmer, a great uh, anything, and not embrace God. You can go out and do your job. You don't need to be a Christian to be a good plumber. But if you're going to create education and your number one goal is to get rid of spirituality, to get rid of the concept of God, to deny the Creator, you're running this in a completely different direction. You're raising an entire culture into what the Bible describes as vanity. Okay. That's 1920 to 1960. 1960 1980, this is the pride generation whose eyes are ever so haughty, glances are disdainful, the self-absorbed, the me generation, the media calls it that. They did these things. 1962, they removed prayer from school. 1963, they made it illegal. Court cases, court cases, made it illegal uh, to have a public reading of the Lord's Prayer in 1963. 1980, posting of the Lord's Prayer anywhere was illegal. 1987, they banned the teaching of creationism. You no longer even have a choice. Up until 1987, although the Humanist, Manif the Humanist Manifesto rejected creationism, you could still present it in the school. 1987, they banned the teaching of creationism in school. Now again, teach, now again you can suggest it, but the teaching that this is truth uh, is illegal in 1987. 1989, the nativity scene cannot be uh, stationed in a public place unless it's with Frosty the Snowman and other secular Christian, Christian things. This is the, the what's taking place in the uh, third generation. They're removing, they're implementing what the second generation, the first generation rejected it, the second generation comes up with a new philosophy, the third generation implements it, and now 19, 2001 to 2040 is the fourth generation. They're going to be the ones that are going to act out in their daily lives the, uh, the opposite of the philosophy that was rejected by the first generation. They're going to act out in their lives the new philosophy created by the second generation, whose eye, who, who are pure in their own eyes but are not cleansed of their filth. What they did in the government publicly in, in the third generation, how lofty are their eyes, they're proud, the me generation. Now the fourth generation is left to implement it in every area of their life. The Bible says this generation is, their teeth are set with swords, their, their jaws are knives. To devour the poor from the earth, the needy from, a mankind, from among mankind. Ironically, sadly, but ironically, the very thing the second generation says they're going to do for the well-being of mankind, to make it function in this temporal world without God, the fourth generation has to begin to devour people, destroy people, consume people, and take things from people so they can preserve their upper class. This is the generation that destroys the middle class. People are going to be destroyed. We see this, again, I could go over uh, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah, in Jesus' time in the New Testament. We can see this cycle. The prophets were speaking to these generations uh, the fourth cycle because they were destroying the middle class. Now, what takes place in these generations is there's going to be those those cycles of judgment and I've got a chart you can see it I'll, I'll, I'll present it to you uh, the chart of what takes place in each of those generations in in uh, in, in the first generation 1880 1920 we ended up with World War one we end up with the plague the Spanish flu just like what's supposed to be take place the second generation it's supposed to be economic upheaval where you're going to have the sky becomes like bronze, there's, there's no crops, everything becomes devastated economically. That is 1920 to 1960. Uh, you, you, we, we got the Great Depression, I mean, the, the Dust Bowls, I mean, it's full. That's exactly, and it's, it was constantly a reminder, hey, consider your ways. 1960 to 19, 2000, crime increased. Things we got out of control. You're going to begin having your, your first school shootings at the end of that third generation. Now the fourth generation began in 2001. That, that, that's what, that's, that's the, what uh, the overlay I'm putting on the biblical teaching. I, 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 I've been doing it since the, the 80s, the 90s. 
2001 is the beginning of the fourth generation. It is that year that the land, according to the book of Leviticus chapter 20, Leviticus 26, that the land is going to be struck with the sword. 2001, the beginning of the fourth generation, a sword is to strike the land if we're in these cycles. Following that sword, people are given a chance to think, to reflect. What does this mean? I, I, personal note, I was amazed on 9-11, 2001, because everybody canceled all the events that, that day, and, and we all went to church. Everybody went to church. And I expected to go to church. I thought, Mike, I saw it happen. I, 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 was, I, I, was, I can tell you the whole situation. I was in my shop. There's a TV on. I could see it. I could see it in school. I could see it. I thought, my gosh, it's, it's happening. I, and my thought was, it's, it's, it, it's beginning. Man, I thought I was just like, I just like went cold. I got class, kids are in class. I see this thing take place. Like, oh my gosh. And I went to, went to church that night knowing that it was time to repent. It was time as a nation to say, we are wrong. And I got there, and the most confusing thing happened in church. We all prayed. Yeah, well, what's wrong with prayer? We were praying, telling God about how bad it was. It's like, right. He, he knows. Yeah, I, I was just like astounded. I walked out and talked to the couple of people. I says, I says, we prayed. Oh, yeah, that's what you do in church. Right, but... But what you what you're you're just telling God we're in trouble we're scared we're in trouble it's like right according to these cycles of judgment he's the one that's causing the trouble he's the one that sent this oh yeah well that's not very popular I know I'm sorry but is it, let's say we told God like can you fix this yeah but first you got to stop coming against me you got to stop coming against my truth. You gotta stop saying it, it's the rotting corpse of Christianity. We don't believe in the Creator. We're gonna do it our own way. Because you're heading into an age of social violence, where teeth, people's teeth, their 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 behavior is going to destroy other people for their own survival. And we've had time. We've had 20 years to think about that. And we've recovered. Everything's fine. But God promised in Leviticus 26, that fourth generation, I'm going to send a plague. I'm going to send a plague that's going to leave you weak. And your enemies are going to then abuse you and work you into a place where you're going to have to ration out your food. And if you don't respond like Nineveh responded to Jonah, then the fifth cycle of discipline is going to begin. Happen. By 2040, where the land is going to be laid waste, God says, I will overthrow the land. I'm not a prophet. This is not something God told me. I'm just telling you the sequence of events in the Bible. What God has said would happen, what took place in Israel's history, what took place in Gentile history of the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Assyrians, it all fits. Oh, it's a conspiracy theory. Okay, great. I, I hope I hope I'm I, I wouldn't it be nice if you could just imagine there's no heaven, no hell below us. Nothing to uh, live or die for. Just just peace. Just everyone just living living as one. That was written by a guy who couldn't get along with Paul McCartney. Don't be stupid. The guy who wants the world to live in peace, no nations, no borders, no possessions. He wants you to embrace no possessions, no nations, no borders, nothing above us, no hell below us, no God. He is telling you this, but he himself can't get along with Paul McCartney. Boomer. There you have it. We're living in the Hamas generation. And my concern is hearts. All these events are going to do is set the condition of the heart in a, in a permanent state. I would like to see revival. I'd like to see people turn to God. Uh, 
But what history shows is that these events like this simply solidify what is already in your heart. If you despise the Word of God, if you mock Christianity, you're going to just step it up a notch. You're going to just throttle it up and come hard. And that's exactly what I expect. Christianity is going to be persecuted in the next 20 years. They can't tolerate it. If you lean towards God, if your heart is towards God, this is so apparent and so obvious that you're, you're, you're responding. It is what it is. Next time I talk on video, I'm going to try to be more of a teacher, less of a preacher. Um, there we have it. The book. You can buy it on Amazon. I don't have any copies left. I do have it online. You can read through There's a lot of things in there that are not necessarily important. You know, I mean, they're important. Some of my personal notes and stuff that I wrote about myself. There's a picture of myself here in a rad, page 126, one of the high places in Israel. That's cool, it's interesting, but that's, I'd like to take this and make this shorter so you don't have to read through all the, so you get right down to the point. Nonetheless, God bless you. Keep your sword sharp, stay strong, and if I've offended you, I'm, really, I'm sorry. I, I apologize, I wanna cry. And if I'm wrong, and this is nothing but just, I've made all this up. I'm just seeing figures in the, in the trees blowing. Cool. That's fine, too. I don't want to die. Hey, thanks for listening.